Our dear viewers and listeners. Greetings to you in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. So we welcome you to today's Bible study. And as the practices, the expectation is that by now you are settled down. They invited somebody over and ready for us to dive into this world. The indisputable unchanging word of God, which will not live your life the same. So as we begin today's session, like the way we always do, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. Your word is life. Mm. It is joy. Mm. It is health. Mm. It is wisdom. Mm. And it is our future. Yes, Lord. We receive it with grace. Mm. We open our hearts to receive it. Yes, Lord. That it can work our work only you, the Holy Spirit, can. Yes, Lord. To the praise and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen. 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 So today's reading, we will be taking it from the book of Romans chapter 3, from verse 1 to verse 8. And this is what the Bible says. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. But what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my life, to his glory. Why am I still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. What is it that we are saying here? We are coming to the conclusion of the message that we began in chapter 1. And here, where Paul begins on the subject of wrath. And the wrath of God is what we are talking about. Upon all that is unrighteous. Upon all that that does not meet his standard. He does not leave us without a clear understanding of what he wants us to get at. You see, 
see, it is one thing to give a message. But it is another for that message to be received the way you want it delivered, received. And that is this whole context of verse 1 to verse 8 of chapter 3. Having addressed the subject of God's wrath. Now Paul is acting like a, a, a lawyer. He brings the objections that would arise from the message that he has spoken. And here he brings the accusations and he brings the counter accusations. So breaking down these eight verses, we see a distinct pattern evolve. In verse 1, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 7. Here we have what I would call the contentions or the accusations. And in verse 2, 4, 6, and 8, we see that here Paul then provides the responses that come as a re the result of these objections. I liken it to the time when we were in school and were debating. Where you would come up with an objection. And then somebody would come up with an argument against that objection. So we are coming up with this kind of approach today. And looking at it. Paul begins with the first objection, which is the question that goes, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? I, to give you a background of where this question is coming from, this is coming from the message that Paul preached from Romans chapter 2 from verse 17 to verse 29. And here he brings to the fore a few things. One that being a Jew does not make you righteous in the sight of God. It does not give you that advantage of God eternally being blessed by God. Similarly, circumcision which was given as a sign to the Jewish people. He says this does not bring salvation. So if being a Jew does not provide salvation, and being circumcised does not provide salvation. Then comes the question. What then is the profit of being a Jew? And what then is the benefit of circumcision? Here, what is happening is that through this message, Paul seems to be against the Jews. And this is what he now goes forward to argue against. So here he says, basically trying to say that it is not being a Jew 
ngalinga gamba ndi okubo te chidi mugwo kubo mu yudaya that makes you have the benefit of salvation e chikugasa ofuno buloko zi neither is circumcision going to save you no kukomolebwa ko sikwe kugendo kuwo buloko zi we saw that circumcision that saves is the circumcision of the heart twaiga o komolebwa okuleto buloko zi kwe komolo okwe okwo mutima which is done by the spirit and not with the hands of men omoyo kwa kola simikono ja bantu and we had a journey from genesis All the way to the New Testament. That brings articulation to this very thought. So the question then comes. What is the benefit? And driving it home it comes back to where we grow up. And if you grew up in a Christian home Does that mean you get you are saved? The answer is no. Nedda. Growing up in a Christian home does not guarantee salvation. Going to a Bible teaching church. It does not guarantee salvation. And going to a Christian school. It does not guarantee salvation. So you ask the question why What is the benefit of being raised in a Christian home? No buza mugaso chi okulira maka go msinjo mu Kristayo. And hope now you are get the picture. No za kate o tegede chifana. So in verse 2 Paul responds to that question. Paul and says much in every way. Nagamba kugasa nyo mu bigambo bingi. Why? Because chiefly kubange cho rubereberie to them who are committed the oracles of God. He's trying to say that in every respect, there is an advantage. Circumcision gives them advantage. Being Jewish gives them advantage. Because they are interested with the oracles of God. Now the oracles of God simply talks about the scriptures. As we see them in the Old Testament. The revelation that salvation can only come through God. Like he says in Isaiah. And says look unto me says the Lord. And be saved. So here we understand that salvation comes from God. So that special revelation which is different from the general revelation that everybody has about God. was given to the Jew. That is privileged information. The message of the gospel and the way to salvation can only be found in scripture and that was given to the Jews so this knowledge places them in a place places them at an advantage because amongst all the nations on the face of the earth these are the only people that had the truth of the saving grace of God so even to us today being pentecostal or Baptist, or Presbyterian, or Church of Uganda, nothing, none of that brings salvation. But there is the benefit, the advantage that comes because you are now a veiled scripture. You are exposed to the truth of God's word. The truth of 
what you need to do to become saved. And it is now your responsibility to act on that truth. And then the benefit of abiding in that truth will come your way. The faith that brings salvation. The Bible tells us comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. May I add this also. That by the fact that you are listening, watching us today. It places you at an advantage. Because you are now being explained. The truth as revealed from the word of God. And this is to a privileged few. Not everyone has access to this information. In verse 3, we then have the second objection. And here Paul says, For what if some did not believe? Where their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? What is he trying to say here? Here now, having explained the advantage, they're now pointing at something else, which is the faithfulness of God to his word. So, here what they're trying to say, and you take it all the way from the book of Genesis. When God called Abraham, he made a promise to Abraham. But when we look at the journey of the children of Israel, we discover that an entire generation perished in the wilderness. Why? Because of their unbelief. So now the question is, if some did not believe and therefore did not enter into the land of promise, where their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect. So what is meant here? Because some people did not believe and therefore did not access what God had promised. Does that mean God failed? Does that mean that God was not faithful? And that is why he comes back in verse 4 and says certainly not. Let God be true. And that you let God be true and every man a liar. Here he uses a very strong Greek phrase. When he says certainly not, he's saying megenoito. Megenoito is a, it is a strong negative word. It is like saying no way. It is like saying not at all. And say let God be found true. And every man a liar. Why is he stressing this? He's trying to say that God will fulfill all his promises. To the Jewish people. Like God will fulfill every promise that he has made to humanity. So, 
your unfaithfulness and my unfaithfulness. Your unbelief and my unbelief does not negate his faithfulness to his promise. So what that means in every matter, God's opinion, God's saying, is what will carry the day. So what matters in life is not what man says. What matters in life is what God says. You see, we live in a world today that believes in democracy. We believe in the voice of the majority. And often where the majority carries the day, we take that to be representative of truth. What the scripture says, what God says is the truth. Irrespective of how many are on his side. So if the voice of the majority goes against the word of God, God's word is the truth. The majority is the lie. And that needs to be clearly put in our consciousness. So that helps us to be able to resist the mindset of the world that points us to the fact that if you can't beat them, then join them. So we must also understand that even though the entire world became unanimous on a certain matter, and God alone is on the other side. What God says is the truth. What God is speaking is the truth. And that is what Paul is trying to say here. That let God be found true. Why? Because we understand further in scripture. Titus 1-2 that it is impossible to, for God to lie. And then Paul goes on to expand on this by bringing Psalms 51 and verse 4 where he says as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you a judge. Justified is the word that means to be proven right. So what is Paul trying to say here? He is trying to say that God's authoritative word will prevail even on the day of judgment. Man is not going to be judged by what men say. Man will be judged. All, all judgment in finality will be according to the standard of God's word. So we as believers in Jesus Christ ought to chart the path of our lives aligning to what God has said with the mindset that what matters in life is what God says on any subject, on any matter irrespective of how many are on that side. Then we go to the third opinion or the third objection that comes up which is targeted at the righteousness of God. 
kuwakanya obutu kilivuwa katonda. The second one was on the faithfulness of God's word. The third is now on the righteousness of God. His dikayosune, his standards. And here is the objection. He says, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? And in parenthesis, Paul adds, I speak as a man. Basically, he now brings himself into the picture of an objector. So what he's trying to say is what was in the mind of many people who could have, who will be reading this later. Come to a thinking that possibly when man's unrighteousness goes up, then God's righteousness will have preeminence. And this is a result of perverted thinking. Of thinking that because the background is darker, then the diamond shines brighter. And Paul is now addressing this. He brings this question in such a way that is amazing. He says, if our unrighteousness, and what he's talking about, he's talking about sin and the unbelief of the Jewish people. And he says, demonstrates the righteousness of God. Meaning that the unrighteousness or the sin and unbelief now glorifies God. So, putting it another way, it will be saying, if our sin brings glory to God, so then why don't we sin more? So, and we will see this expanded in chapter 6 of the book of Romans. So, it is like saying, if God is glorified when we sin, or you're saying, if God is glorified in everything. If including the sins that we commit. Then why don't we continue to sin? Or the more since everything that we do glorifies God. And then Paul Paulo says, what shall we say? Here he brings the plural. And so he's trying to say now the why would God inflict wrath on the unrighteousness when it is the unrighteousness that glorifies his righteousness. And he begins to say, now I'm speaking as a man. And to bring that to context, this is the, he's trying to say, this is the human logic. And in verse 6, he brings the response to that. And says, certainly not. Basically, what he's trying to say, <laughs> he's saying, what you are saying is nonsense. God forbid. So this logic does not have any substance to it. So to the contrary, what is he trying to say? He's trying to say that God is going to judge all unbelieving, both the Jew 
and the Gentile. So there is no special treatment to anyone. No one will escape the judgment of God. God is righteous in his judgment of all sinners. And this includes the Jew and the Gentile. Which brings us to the fourth objection. Which says, for if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, then why am I still being judged as a sinner? Now, this follows the same line of thought. But this is an attack on God's holiness. It is an objection to God's holiness. To the fact that it is perceived that the lie will bring glory to God. And because the lie is bringing glory to God, then why would God judge me? And when Paul is responding to this one, he is very emphatic in his response. Actually, it is unlike what he has done before. He now comes up with a question and says, why not say? Let us do evil that good may come. As we are slanderously reported. So here is a case of somebody misrepresenting what they had. And as some affirm that we say. And in response to that, Paul simply makes this assertion. He says their condemnation is just. So what is he trying to say? <laughs> He's saying by having this perverted school of thought, they have already the wrath and the condemnation of God upon them. And he says that condemnation is just. It is like saying it is at your feet. You have already determined where this all ends. So as we get this message together, what is Paul trying to communicate? Through these eight questions, the four that we saw, two in verse one, the two in verse three, the two in verse five, and the two in verse Seven. Here we see a number of nuggets that we need to pick out. That to many of us that have received this message of hope, we have been wonderfully blessed by God. That for you to hear the word of God, for you to hear the message of hope of salvation by Christ Jesus, for you to be a recipient of the message of the will of God concerning the hope of mankind. This places you and I at an advantage. But this does not mean that exposure to this message means that you are saved. Uh-uh. Exposure requires an action from you. The same way the Jew had 
the oracles of God. The expectation was that they would be obedient to these oracles. So you and I, having these messages, coming through the internet, coming through social media, coming through television, when we go to church, when we at school, puts us in a place of advantage. But there is a response that needs to come from every one of us. Yes, we have a privilege. But a privilege comes with the responsibility to respond. The second point that we glean from here is the reliability of God's word. Basically, what that means is that all that God has said is true. Mazima. This is what the prophet says in Isaiah 40. And verse 8. He says the grass withers. The flower fades away. But the word of God abides forever. So whatever you see may pass. Jesus said heaven and Earth may pass away. Yes, you are going to But my word abides. So the word of God abides. And that needs to come to our mind. That where we are in disagreement with God's word, then we are not on the side of truth. We are liars. So one word that I would exchange with truth is the word reality. So today we live in a world that uh, has embraced reality TVs. And reality shows are gathering so much sponsorship. Because there are so many people who want to see what is the real thing. So, the way things are, and the way things really are, what explains the way really things are is the word of God. So what explains who man really is, is what God says man is. What explains what sin is, is what God says in his. So if God says this is sin, whatever description you come up with, if it is not in line with what God has said, if it is contrary to what God has said, then it is not the reality. So in the same way, salvation Salvation is what God says salvation is. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is what God's word says. That Jesus is the way to the Father. So if all the world believes there are many ways to God, that is the opinion. It may be the majority, but this is not up to vote. Jesus says, I am the way. 
You and I should believe what God says. Because God's word is truth. And truth is the reality. Now it is not just about salvation. Being what God says it is. But salvation is to be received this way God says it should be received. So we believe and are justified. We confess and are saved. That is the way it happens. Now you may put up a ceremony and say no, there is this ceremony that makes you a child of God. That is your personal opinion. The Bible says as many as received him. To them he gave the power to become the sons of God. So there is no other way Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew and to the Gentile. What is he trying to tell us? That salvation comes through faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. That is God's way how salvation is received. There is no other way. There is no ceremony. This is not about people congregating and agreeing on a certain doctrine or coming up with a dogma. No, 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 no. God's word is reliable. In the same way, heaven and hell. Today I've met a lot of people who say, how can a loving God send people to eternal condemnation. For me, I can't believe in such a God. Lord, have mercy upon you. But the fact is that hell and heaven are a reality. I, I met someone who said, no, heaven is not there. I'm like, you have not even read what Jesus said. Through his messages, he made so many pronouncements about hell and heaven. And we cannot miss it if we go through the scriptures. So we need to understand that hell and heaven are what God says they are. The final judgment is what God says it is. So if anyone or anything agrees disagrees with the word of God. Then that is the lie. God is true. And the scripture says, let every man be a liar. And God be true. God's word is truth. The third point that we glean from here is the certainty of the wrath of God. So this we cannot overlook. All the way from 118 of the book of Romans to where we have, we have seen one that it is God who inflicts wrath. And this wrath will come against all sin and unrighteousness of men. I, I have been surprised. Many people say, no, we need to separate the sin and the sinner. God punishes the sin and I'm like... He, I'm like, where are we getting this? We need to go back and see. 
What the scripture says concerning the wrath of God. Let's not have this concept that hell is one air conditioned place. So, it is not that hell is a real place. It is full of torment. It is full of regret. It is full of weeping. It is a place you don't want to go to. And Jesus says, I am the way that takes you out of that place. To those that have believed on Jesus Christ, that is why we celebrate. Because we know what we have been delivered from. We were delivered from the wrath of God. Satan is not in the picture here. Because he will also be condemned. So, what you, when you come to Jesus, are saved from is the wrath of God that comes upon all unrighteousness and comes upon all sin of mankind. And the only way to escape that is the cross of Calvary. Faith in Jesus Christ. And finally, that the final point we glean from here is that at the end of it all, the justice of God will be given in an equal manner to both the Jews and the Gentiles as long as they have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So if you are here watching us, listening to us, you have never personally surrendered your life to Jesus. To make him the personal Lord and Savior of your life. So that he will wash away your sins and make you a child of God. This is your opportunity. Why don't you fall down before God? Right now, where you are, Acknowledge that you are a sinner. Ask for his forgiveness, which he provides through Christ Jesus. Believe and receive the person of Jesus and his finished work. And salvation will be yours. Both now and forevermore. Why don't you say this prayer? Say, God, creator of heaven and earth. Today I understand that your wrath is revealed upon all sin and all unrighteousness to men. I am a sinner. I need a savior in my life. Jesus, Jesus, you are the savior of the world. And at Calvary, you paid the price for my sin. Today I receive you in my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Lord, take charge of my life. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me by your spirit. Guide me. Help me to live victoriously for you in this world. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. You say that prayer. You have been saved. There is a, call, a phone on the screen. Please call. Somebody will pick it up. And provide you with the first instruction on this journey of faith. And God will bless you mightily. So from Dominion Church, it's been a pleasure to have you today.
as we contemplated on the questions and the answers concerning the wrath of God. So till we meet again, the same God bless you. Shalom.